If you will, turn in your Bibles to the second chapter of 2 Peter as we continue our study through the Word. We've come to the second chapter now of this short letter that Peter wrote. You remember that last time we saw that Peter wrote this at the end of his life. He says that he must shortly put off this tent, which was a, a description of his death that was going to be coming soon. And so what we have is the compression of the things that he had learned in walking with the Lord and living out his faith for three decades and, and being on the battlefield that, that he was on. You remember that he talked about our faith, how important our faith is, how important your faith is. Your faith is your connection to God. Your faith is your belief in God. It is through your belief in God that every blessing in your life flows. Your salvation comes by grace, but it's through faith. It is trusting God and believing God. And it is through that bridge, that avenue, that the fullness of life is, is transferred from God to us. How is your faith? What is the condition of your faith? It was the, the first thing that Peter wanted to talk about. He said that to our faith, you remember, that, that we needed to add virtue, moral excellence, and to moral excellence, knowledge, and, and to knowledge, and self-control, and perseverance, and godliness, and brotherly kindness, and in love. These are the building blocks of, of the Christian faith, the man of God, the woman of God. And so Peter wanted us to make sure that, that our faith was strong, healthy, vibrant, our connection to God. And then he, he talked about the fact that, that we have our faith, and then in addition to our faith, our bridge, our connection to God, we have the sure word of God. The prophetic word of God. And we talked last time about how every religion has, has a collection of writings, has their sacred writings, their holy writings. But, but God put in his holy word an identifiable marker that would separate it from the counterfeits. Everything that is valuable will have a counterfeit, but there is always a way to tell the original from the counterfeit. And God put his signature into the word of God that no one can counterfeit. And what is that sign that he put in there? Prophecy. God stands outside of time. The future is the same as the past. He knows all things. He is not linear. He is outside of time. Time is linear, but God engulfs in time. And so, he knows the end from the beginning. And that's exactly what he said in the book of Isaiah, that you might know that I am the true and the living God, that you might know. And that word know means beyond a shadow of a doubt, no. Not guessing, not hoping, not dreaming, not trusting, but that you might know with an absolute certainty that I am the true and the living God and there is no other I will show you the end from the beginning. Peter now experienced the fulfillment of all of those messianic prophecies. As Peter was ministering to those in the old covenant and drawing them out into the new covenant, there had been the prophetic descriptions of the Messiah all the way through to, to where he would be born, how he would die, how he would suffer, how he would be between two thieves, and, and on and on and on and on the, the, the prophetic description. And Peter now, in hindsight, sees the, the prophetic word of God written hundreds and thousands of years in advance, specific, minute, by different authors and different languages on different continents that, that God would show that, that he transcends all limitations and he is the God without bounds and that you might know that you have the absolute truth. And so 
Your faith connects you to this living God and you have the absolute sure word of God, the authentic autograph uh, biography of a God that you have in your hands. In this next chapter, he is going to tell us that we still need to be careful as believers. For though we're connected to God by faith and we have the holy scriptures in our hands, there will be teachers that will rise up, false teachers that will take those scriptures and twist them. And they will then, for their own personal gain and profit, they they will bend the word of God to make it say what they want it to say. And as a believer, you need to be careful that though the truth is in the word of God, it must be handled diligently and carefully. That just because a person stands uh, up on a platform and, and holds a black book with ribbons, <laughs> lost my ribbons. <laughs> doesn't mean that he's trustworthy. (laughs) But that like a Berean, you need to test every single thing against the word of God. That you need to know the word of God and you need to know it in context and you need to know what it says and you need to know the heart of God and the love of God. And so as Peter couldn't be with us to shepherd us, he has a shepherd's heart over us and and wants to make sure that we don't get tricked by any charlatans, hooligans, that would seek to merchandise gods and people for their own collective gain. So we talked about our faith. He talked about having the sure word of God. And now let's listen to his warning about the things that would take place. And he, looking forwards and prophetically speaking of the Uh, of the things that would take place in the end times. He begins here in this second chapter in verse one saying, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Under the old covenant, God appointed prophets and these prophets were the ones that spoke the word of God. They listened to the voice of God and then they spoke what they heard. They were God's spokesmen to the people. But there were false prophets that rose up. The Old Testament is, is replete with these false prophets that stood up and declared that this is what God is saying. And oftentimes those false prophets would be completely contradicting what the true prophets of God were were saying. God's word is always going to be challenged, amen? So whether it's the spoken word through the prophet or the written word of the Bible, it's always going to be challenged. Every single thing of God, everything that is holy and pure and wonderful and is of the Lord is going to be challenged by the opposition and the enemy. So we now have the sure word of God. Back then they had the prophets, but they had false prophets. Now we have the sure word of God and we have teachers, but Peter says, guess what? You're going to have false teachers that are going to come in. Just as there were false prophets, there's also going to be false teachers. So just because you have the word of God doesn't insulate you now from deception. You still need to be careful. He says that they will, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Peter's gonna let us know that these false teachers, they are going to be judged by God. But he says that they have brought in dangerous, he says, destructive heresies, even to the denying of the Lord. Her heretics and heretical teachings normally always center around the identity of Jesus Christ. You always want to look at the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Whenever you're talking to someone who claims to to be a Christian, you want to know who they say Jesus is. Because though we will use the same terms, they will use a different dictionary. We have the same vocabulary, but oftentimes we are using a different dictionary. 
And so these destructive heresies center around the identity of Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly teaches that God is one God in three persons, that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity of the Godhead. But you will see these destructive heresies that, that come in. And so false teachers oftentimes will say that Jesus uh, is actually a little bit less than the Father and that Lucifer and Jesus are brothers. They will make in Jesus and Lucifer to be the sons of uh, God. Uh, and kind of like the Wizard of Oz where you have the good witch and the bad witch, you know, Jesus got to be the good son and, and Lucifer, he got the short stick. He got to, he, he's the bad son. And, uh, and so they build this out heresy district denying the deity of Jesus Christ and reducing him to a created being to to a son of the father instead of coexisting eternally with the father so anytime that he is not coexistent to with the father and part of the uh, of the godhead then you have reduced uh, Christ when you change Christ you destroy christianity because Christianity is the following of Christ. And, and so the attack of heretics and of heresies center around the identity. Others would say that in Jesus, another heretical teaching, destructive heretical teaching, is that Jesus and Michael, the archangel, are the same. And that mm, Jesus in the Bible is Michael of the archangel. And, and back and forth, and they're interchangeable. The destructive heresy of that is Michael, the archangel, is a created being. He's an angelic being. He is on the order of Satan. Satan was a created being. He was a cherubim, an anointed cherubim in heaven, but a created being. Jesus is not a created being. And so the minute that you say that Jesus is uh, uh, the Michael, the archangel in the Bible, you have reduced him from deity to angel. And so here we see the, the attack. And so uh, the Bible declares that God was manifested in the flesh, that Jesus Christ was God manifested in, in the flesh. The, the Gospel of John begins right in the opening chapter, the opening verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God and he was in the beginning with uh, God and, and all things uh, were made by him and without him was not anything made uh, that was made. You remember the, uh, the apostle Thomas and how Thomas was not with uh, the others on the night of Jesus's resurrection when they were gathered together in, in the upper room. And the other disciples, the other apostles told them how Jesus had to appear to him. And Thomas said, I will not believe. Not I cannot believe. I will, I will not believe until I examine the imprints in his hand uh, and the hole in his side. And you remember that it was a week later that Jesus once again appears to them. And this time Thomas is in the room. And the Lord calls to Thomas, Thomas, come. Place your hands in the imprints in mine. And here is my side. Touch the wound. And you remember what Thomas's response was. He says, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God, not my Lord and an anointed cherub. <laughs> my Lord and my God. Paul would say, for our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. No, to remove the deity of Jesus Christ is to completely change who God is in the plan of salvation. And so these destructive heresies, uh, oftentimes they center around the person and the identity of Jesus Christ. In verse 2, it says, And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. And so we see that popularity is not an insulation uh, for us. We see that popularity is not a discerner of truth. 
We need to discern truth by the word of God, not by what is popular in that day. It says that the way of truth will be blasphemed. These false teachers will rise up and they will blaspheme the, uh, the truth. Now, oftentimes false teachers are better known for what they deny than for what they affirm. False teachers hide behind what they affirm, but it is in the things that they deny that truly you can discover them as false teachers. False teachers will deny the inspiration of the Bible. They will use the Bible, but ultimately, if they are pinned down on the question, they do not believe that every single word in the Bible is absolutely true. And so they will hedge uh, on that. The minute that you remove the authority of the Word of God and the inspiration of the Word of God, you chew, you turn the Bible into what I call buffet-style Christianity where you then come to the Bible as a buffet. Oh, I like that verse. Oh, that one. I don't like that one. I'm not listening to that one. And, and you pick and choose what's inspired, what isn't inspired in it. And, and so they will deny the, the inspiration word for word that, that, that the Holy Spirit was not capable of crafting every single word that's in there. This... Right here, the word of God, I believe to be the most complex of, of all things. I believe that God created this beyond, that it will take eternity for us to understand it in, in the fullness of how he created to be. And he protected it and crafted the Holy Spirit, moved holy men of God, wrote under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and, and God didn't allow not one dot, not one tittle to be out of place to make this magnificent portrait in its entirety, that, that its depth, the three dimension down to the spaces in between between the letters and the very letters themselves, I believe that all of them have significance and meaning. It is amazing to me, amazing to me, that the early scribes uh, that studied the, the word of God believed that the letters and the very space between them have had meaning. And within the very first line in the book of Genesis, as they studied the lines and the spaces, this is what they believed. They said that they believed... Uh, they believed that God created the earth in 10 dimensions, that creation is in 10 dimensions. They had no idea what that even meant, but by the spaces and the letters, they believed that, that God created. Thousands of years ago, they created, well, at that time, we only believed in three dimensions, that, that there's a three-dimensional existence. It was Albert Einstein who then told us that time is actually a, a fourth dimension and that it stretches and expands and, and that it is the fourth dimension. Today, science are postulating that there are six more dimensions that are curled in on top of themselves and that the scientific research is declaring that they believe that we live in a 10-dimensional existence. Something that the early scribes believed by looking at the spaces between the letters and the opening lines in the book of Genesis. The word of God is beyond uh, our understanding. It is supernatural. And anybody who would deny the inspiration of it, uh, they are a false teacher. They, uh, they absolutely border now on, on the heretic. They will also deny the sinfulness of man. You will have teachers that say that you're basically a good person and that what you need to do is to let that goodness in you come out and unleash the good person that's inside of you. If you hear somebody tell you about what a good person you are on the inside, <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> That is a false teacher. That is, there is nothing good in you. <laughs> Paul tells that. I didn't say that. He says that in my flesh dwells no good thing. Now, when Adam and Eve were created, they were good. He looked on all of his creation. It was good. Everything that God created was good. But then sin entered in and corrupted what was good. And so they will deny the, the sinfulness, the, the depravity of man. Anybody that, that, that seeks to tell you that you're a good person. And then they will bend the teaching. You're a good person. 
And so God loves good people and all good people go to heaven and, and they build all of this doctrine built around the fact that deep down inside you're really a good person. And that appeals to people. People want to believe that they're, that, that they're a good person. <laughs> Even criminals in prison believe they're a good person. They're better than the maximum security people. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I didn't do very much wrong. I'm basically a good person. Made a few mistakes, and so every so so there is that doctrine that appeals to uh, to the good that is in uh, a person. They will deny the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. They will deny that salvation comes by faith alone, and that there is no other way uh, into heaven except uh, through faith. And they will deny the reality of eternal judgment. And they will deny, oftentimes, the reality of hell itself. Today, it's very popular. There, there is a growing movement to where we believe in heaven, but not in hell. And, and, that, and that everybody gets to go to heaven, that there's layers of heaven. This is the way. There are layers of heaven. And if you're not such a nice person, you get to go into the lower level of heaven. <laughs> Okay, and everybody gets to go there, and so, you know, you can work your way up to a higher level of heaven, and if you'll buy my tapes online, I'll teach you how to get there. <laughs> These are false teachers. Please don't send anybody money for that. <laughs> it says in verse 3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. By covetousness. That the root of their false teaching is money. False teachers love money. That's what they, they love. I will tell you that the prosperity doctrine and teachers, the, the name it, claim it, prosperity teachers grieve my soul. They, they grieve my spirit. Nowhere more was that on display than, than in Uganda. Uganda is a very poor country. I mean, poor country. The people are, are, are impoverished. Third world countries normally are mm, impoverished. They, they do well within their lack of structure and infrastructure of society, but, but their lives are difficult. And they struggle to put food on the table, and they struggle for shelter, and they struggle for clean water. I mean, those are the basic struggles in third world countries that they, uh, that they will battle. And the prosperity doctrine is so popular in third world countries. They recognize that they're the have-nots, and they're the have-nots that want to be the haves. And so they are ripe now. And these prosperity teachers come into these third world countries, and, and they come in wearing the, the most expensive suits that, that money can possibly buy. They have the, the Rolexes and the most expensive watches. They drip uh, with wealth. They come into the churches in limousines, and they come with an entourage uh, as well. They stand up and they declare this message. God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be rich. And all you need to be rich, listen to me, all you need to be rich is faith. Faith is your avenue to riches. And what you need to do is you just need to have the faith of a mustard seed. And if you will just take the faith of a mustard seed, if you will take your, your bread and cast it onto the waters, God will multiply that bread. And so here's what you need to do. Take your money, whatever money you have, that's your bread. And, and you want to cast that onto the waters. You want to give that money to God. And whatever amount of money you give to God, God's going to multiply back to you. So if you just want a little bit of a blessing, just give him a little bit of your money. If you want a big blessing, give him a lot of money, and God will multiply back according to your faith whatever you're willing to see, to give him. And by the way, I, I am going to be the, the holder of God's money, so uh, what you need to do is give it to me, okay, and, and I'm God's representative, and then go stand by your mailbox and wait for the blessings to start rolling in. Sadly, those, those people will take their mites and give it to these people who then just pocket it for their own wealth and fly on these luxury private jets and sell God's people out for their own money. He says covetousness is what is behind these false teachers. 
I am grieved over these false teachers that would make such a, a scandal of God's people. But what I cannot understand is the Church of Scientology. That, that one just absolutely baffles me. I, I can understand how people can be tricked into trying to better their lives and to get out of their impoverished state. The Church of Scientology was started by L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard was a prolific science fiction and fantasy writer. In 1948, he was speaking at a, a science fiction convention. He was speaking at the Eastern Science Fiction Association. It was November 7th, 1948. And he was talking about the fact that as many books as he had written, that he, he didn't make a lot of money from his writings. He said, and I quote, that... I'm going to get the quote... Here it is. You don't get rich writing science fiction. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. And that's what he said in 1948. Two years later, he wrote the book of, of Dianetics in 1950. And then from the book of Dianetics, he founded the Church of mm, Scientology, became the leader of the religion, and became incredibly wealthy. Just exactly mm, what he said. So this person who writes fables and stories and made up science and fiction suddenly now becomes the authority of God and the revelation of God to people and starts a religion. I cannot understand how somebody can follow someone who made a career making up stories. And, and yet we see that the word of God says that they are going to that they are going to rise up and that they will become popular. Scientology is popular in Hollywood and, and there are many Hollywood stars that are involved in leading others into the church of Scientology. Deceptive words, he says. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Here's where Peter is going with this. Peter is saying God's going to judge them. And he's showing us the, the past of where God has judged iniquity. These false teachers are filled with iniquity, and God is going to judge them. That is going to be their end. So he's going to rapid fire now cite three examples of God's judgment. He, he is going to, uh, to talk about and hear the rebellion against God in heaven. He's going to talk about Noah, and then he's also going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is this linear thinking now to these false false teachers that are also right in line for God's judgment. So we don't need to worry about these false teachers. They are going to be judged. We just need to avoid the false teachers is what Peter is telling us. And so verse six, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So to not Fear God and to take and to merchandise God's people, Peter is showing you that those who live ungodly are going to be judged. And so they are going to have their end. And he showed them God's judgment in the past. God is kind and long suffering, and he is willing to forgive. But if you are going to make merchandise of ungodliness, you are going to be judged. God will judge the ungodly. In verse 7, it says, And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Lot lived right in Sodom and Gomorrah, right when it had reached its wicked fulfillment. When it had reached its apex, Lot is living there. And his soul is just disquieted by the iniquity and the immorality that was going around. The, the grievous conditions in that city that God said, you know what, that's enough. This whole city is going to be no more. It was such a den of iniquity 
that God says that I am just going to absolutely destroy it. Well, Lot lived in it. And God pulled him out, but living in that environment, we see here that, that it vexed his soul. Verse 9, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness. The Lord knows how to deliver. The Lord knows how to deliver. It's important for you to know that, to underline that, to hold on to that promise in God's living word. I wonder if Peter was reminded of his own life of when he was arrested and put into maximum security in the prison. He was shackled, chained, handcuffed between two prisoners, I mean, between two guards, a guard on each side of him, and and they slept in maximum security with with two guards on each side. It was in the middle of the night that the angel comes to Peter and wakes him up, and the shackles fell right off of his wrists didn't wake up the guards and and the lord tells the, the angel rather tells and peter now to to follow him and the doors that were locked and secured just open and the next thing you know peter finds himself out in the night air he doesn't know whether he's dreaming or this is reality but the cool of the night air and the angel departs and suddenly peter's on the streets and there in Jerusalem, and, and he goes to the, uh, to the house where the early church was meeting. It was late at night, and, and he knocks on the door, and they're having a, a prayer meeting inside. They were praying for Peter, and, and you remember that the servant girl comes and opens up the door and looks at him and goes, wow, you look a lot like Peter, and closes the door on him. <laughs> he goes, I look like Peter because, hello, I am Peter. And, and how the Lord delivered him out of maximum security bondage. Today, you might identify with that. You might be going through just a a, a tremendous trial. You might feel like you are just locked down and that there is no avenue of rescue or escape. It might be a relationship. It might be a, a marriage. It might be family issues. It might be financial. It might be health that has got you so compressed that you feel like you're locked in in a dungeon with guards on either side of you. Know this, God knows how to deliver you. God knows how to deliver you. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And so God knows uh, how to deliver the godly and, and God knows how to judge the ungodly. I wonder if he was thinking about Herod. Herod who lived in his opulence and, and, all, and yet his presumption, his pride, his arrogance, his pomp, and filled with self, and you remember that the Lord smites him then with the, with the judgment, and, and he dies a horrible death. God knows how to judge the ungodly, and God knows how to rescue the godly. Peter himself walked right out of prison with an angel leading the way. He says now that that those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, how they are presumptuous and self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. He says that these false teachers and false leaders, they're like brute beasts. He's, he's talking about animals that cannot be domesticated. There's animals that are large and powerful in size that can be domesticated. An elephant can be domesticated and can be used and trained to pick up timbers and move things uh, uh, around, powerful creatures. But there's other animals that are wild and cannot be domesticated and you cannot use or have them as, mm, as pets. He says that these wild animals, they're, they're good for nothing. 
He says these false teachers, they, they have the word of God, but they won't be trained in the word of God. They, they won't become domesticated in relationship with God. They just remain a wild animal to God, and they will bite uh, and are ferocious in their independence. He says there's nothing that, that you can do with those animals are good for nothing, only to be destroyed. Verse 13. And they will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Here we see Peter says they're amongst us and they feast with us. But look at the description, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. They cannot stop themselves from sinning. Enticing, unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have hearts trained, trained in covetous practices. Hearts that are trained in wickedness. The Bible tells us to train up a child in the way that they should go, to train them up in truth and righteousness, that they would practice truth and righteousness, get good at being able to, uh, to practice truth and righteousness. He says, but there are others that, that practice evil. Think about that. That means that they want to get better and better at being evil and to become more and more efficient in their wickedness. When I think of that, I think of, of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. I think of the wickedness of the plan to exterminate the Jewish people. That in and of itself is satanic in its origin. That is wickedness at its, at its core. It is important that we always recognize and stand up for the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, and he's not done with them at all. But all that are against Israel and against God's people, we see that that is a form of wickedness. But Hitler brought it to, uh, uh, to a pinnacle when he sought to exterminate them in, in concentration camps. Amber and I toured Dachau in Germany, which was one of the early concentration camps. It was in its beginning a holding place for political dissenters. But then it began one of the first places where they actually began to exterminate the, the Jews there. And, and they began by shooting them. But then they began to believe that it was too expensive to use bullets uh, on the, the Jews. And they thought that that was too expensive. And, and the scope of what they wanted to do to, to exterminate all of the Jews. So they wanted to become more efficient, more cost effective. How, how can we kill them uh, with, a, with a lower economic drain mm, to us. And, and so they developed the gassing method and, and they would gas them in the showers. But in Dachau, it, it, the showers were just small showers for uh, not the, the giant showers and, and because it was originally for bathing. But they began to, to exterminate them in the showers and the gas. And, and then they started to have a buildup of the bodies. And now that they had killed them, it's, it's what do we do with the, the bodies? And in the beginning, it was the mass graves, but the mass graves were highly ineffective. They needed a, a more efficient way of, of disposing of these bodies on a grand scale. And so they began to build ovens. And at Dachau, they had uh, some of the original ovens that they had built. But the ovens were small because this was small scale. And, and they began to learn how to do this more effectively. And as you see, the other concentration camps that were built after Dachau, they started to have larger showers and until ultimately at Auschwitz and some of the other uh, notorious camps that there were, they had enormous showers where they were just hurting the people in. And then they had these enormous ovens to be able to take and, uh, and to burn the bodies afterwards. They they were practicing wickedness, getting good at it, refining it. I want you to know that, uh, that wickedness is seeking to be refined in our day and age. And that just like the children of Israel were the targets of it, we also are the, the targets of it. 
It seeks to find a way into your heart, into your life, into your family, into your marriage, into your job. It, it seeks opportunity to come into your eyes, into your ears, into your mind. And, and it seeks to become more efficient, more effective with you, to, to take and destroy whatever is good in you, whatever is holy, pure, and of God, and evil is seeking to practice uh, at destroying it within you. Here he says that these are accursed children. Everybody is a child of, of God. We're all made in the image and likeness of God, but, but these now that are used as instruments of, of the enemy, they are not the children that are fulfilling what they were created for. They were created to be in, in relationship with God and to experience the love and joy of, of his presence. But these that would drag men's souls down into hell with them, he says they practice wickedness, and he says they're accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor. Now Balaam is an example that we have. His story is told in, in Numbers chapter 22, beginning there, and, and you can read forwards on it. But you see that this was a man that would do almost anything for money. And, and we see how covetousness ruled over his life. It says now that, uh, that they have gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. He says, they are wells without water. Is there anything more worthless than a well without, a wa without water in it? You're thirsty, you're parched, there's a well. Oh, praise God, you go over and there's dust in the bottom of the well. You have livestock and the animals that you need to water. Oh, there's a well and it's empty. These false teachers, they, they promise refreshment, but they're a dry well. Clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jesus described Gehenna as the place of outer darkness. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure, they attract through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. I want you to know that we were never made to be the masters over our life. That we are meant to, to serve. But God gave us free will so that we could choose who we're going to serve. And if we serve the Lord, then we will serve him. He says, come all ye who, are, uh, who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is light and my way is easy. And so you yoke together with the Lord and let him be your master or you will ultimately go into a bondage and serve a master not of your choosing. And so here we see that they are in captive. They promise freedom, but they themselves uh, uh, have been brought into bondage. He says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions uh, of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. So I believe this is talking about people that come into the church and they, they view and are attracted to, to the church and the things of the Lord. They read their Bibles and they see the moral conduct of Christians. And then what they try and do is they try and do it in their own strength. They try and become that, that good person. And they take the word of God and they turn it into a self-help manual. And now they look at the fruit of the Spirit, and they're going to start to try and produce more fruit in their life. And they look at the lists of the characteristics, and they try now and do that. And they make a concentrated effort for a short period of time. 
and then they fall away. They never accept Jesus Christ. They're never born again. They never have the dunamis, the power of God that, that changes us into it. They try and do it on their own. And they are about as successful as we are with New Year's resolutions. <laughs> By the way, how are you doing on your New Year's resolution right now, a few months uh, uh, down the road? And, uh, and so the work of the flesh falls uh, away. He says, now, and maybe you've met these kind of people, you invite them to church or go to talk to them about the things of the Lord. They said, oh, I tried religion. It didn't work for me. Right? It didn't work for me. If it works for you, hey, great, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for you. It's not supposed to be work. See, that was the whole problem. But now, he says, their condition right there is worse than, than when they just didn't know God at all because now they have a resistance because they tried and they failed. Uh, and so they, they now have a larger hurdle to overcome in their life. These false teachers put people into bondages and then afterwards they can fail. And then they don't want to know anything about the Lord anymore. It's just left a bad taste in, in their mouth. He says, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. You see, the problem with a self-help program is, is that you normally revert to your nature. But when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have a new nature. And so he gives you that, that new nature. The people that try and do it on their own, they return back to their carnal, carnal nature, to their fallen nature. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention for a minute to verse 5 where it talks about Noah and how God saved uh, Noah. God saved Noah out of the wickedness of, uh, of his generation. I want you to notice that God didn't protect Noah and his family by isolating them from the world, but by enabling them to remain pure in the midst of corruption. Remaining pure in the midst uh, of corruption. Jesus, as he was walking past the temple with his disciples, he, he told them, you'll remember that not one stone is going to remain upon another. And you remember they asked him, when is this going to happen? When is the end of, of time going to be? When is the Lord going to return to them? And, and Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives and gives the, what is known as the Olivet Discourse. And, and Jesus says that, that the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming uh, of the Son of Man. He says, for as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man, or the Son, come, the son, of, come, you know, the son of Man will be. So there are two things that we recognize and understand that Jesus is, is speaking of. Number one, the, the swiftness. It's just going to happen. And the culture is going to be moving. Life is going to be moving. Stock market is going to be trading. And, and boom, the, the Lord is going to return. So there is a, a swiftness without warning that is going to take place. But secondly, he also says that as in the days of Noah, so also will it be when the Son of Man returns. And so he's speaking now about the, the condition of the culture and the condition of the world. Prophetic, right here, as God is declaring the things that are going to be and, and lets us know. So what, what were the days of Noah like? What, what are the things here that, that Jesus was referring? And where are we on the prophetic time clock when we look at it through this prophecy that as in the days of Noah? Well, number one, the population was expanding in the days of Noah. Global population was uh, on the, the rise and, and growing. And we see that also today that the world population is growing and continues to grow. There are those who say that overpopulation is becoming a problem. And, uh, and so we see that, uh, that we are, as in the days of Noah, we are continuing to grow. Secondly, going back to Genesis chapter 6 that talks about these things, the world was filled with wickedness. Wickedness had taken root. It had taken hold. Goodness had lost its ability to contain wickedness. The Bible says that a little leaven, what? 
Leaven's the whole lump, that, uh, that leaven will spread. And, and wickedness now had spread throughout the, the whole world. And, and today we see that there is, it is not morality that is spreading throughout the world, but it is wickedness that is spreading. Immorality is growing across the world. Acceptance of, of sin as normal and acceptable lifestyles and choices. It, it is spreading throughout the world. We are living in a time when wickedness is absolutely spreading. That's the days of Noah here also. Along with the wickedness, it's in the days of Noah were marked by violence. Tremendous uh, violence was um, taking um, place. And, and we are seeing great violence um, today in, um, in our culture. And, and also in the days of Noah, lawlessness abounded. Lawlessness. Lawlessness is everybody can do what's right in their own eyes. Whatever is right, whatever feels good, whatever you want to do, you just do this. There is no moral authority that you are accountable to or that you will answer. In the schools today, I am particularly concerned. The violence that is in the schools is incomprehensible to me. Incomprehensible. I cannot even begin to imagine going to school and walking through the halls and having a police officer, not called to the school because there was an incident. That is his beat. That is where he is stationed, to walk up and down the halls, not just with a nightstick, uh, with a gun, a loaded weapon with bullets in the in schools uh, because of the violence, to be able to protect uh, the kids. Not just to protect them from the outside, it is not just that our culture has become so violent, which it has, that the culture itself would target the innocence of the school children and, and then seek to come in and to destroy innocent lives, which it is. And so the police officers are there to protect against the invasion of a violent culture but also to keep the kids from killing each other. The kids that are bringing guns to school and starting to shoot other students, classmates uh, uh, now. And so armed officers in schools to keep kids from killing each other and not just to keep them from killing each other, but to keep them from killing teachers. And to keep teachers safe from students. In my day, and, and I'm old. <laughs> I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> we didn't have police officers. We did have monitors in the halls. <laughs> Hall monitors, we called them. Kids with fake badges. <laughs> that wrote down everything that you did and snitched on you. <laughs> Those were the, that was the protection that, uh, that we had in, in our day. It's a different world. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, lawlessness, violence, a world filled with wickedness. He says, we're, true believers were a minority. Noah and his family were the only righteous people. And, and they were marginalized. They were mm, ignored. Even though they preached the goodness of God, the salvation of God, he built a boat for 100 years, nobody listened. They wanted to do what they wanted to do, and they wanted no part of God. They wanted no part of the restrictions of God. And so... God protected Noah and his family from the wickedness that was around. Not by isolating them from the world, but by empowering them and enabling them to remain pure in the midst of mm, corruption. God knows how to protect the godly. He knows how to deliver the godly. And I want you to know that we are living in the times of Noah. There is no doubt in my mind. 
to watch the news, to watch prophecy unfolding, to see how Russia and Iran are in partnership right now against Israel seeking to ramp back up again its nuclear program. Iran has one agenda, and that is to destroy Israel. And so, in the Bible, we see the nations that will align themselves together against Israel, and the two chief nations are Iran and Russia that will work in, in joint partnership. We see this happening in the news right now. Putin and the, and the leaders of Iran are shaking hands and affirming their relationship once again. In the Soviet Union, Russia is supporting Iran's uh, start they're, they're restarting and back up again their, their nuclear arms and development. And it is not a, a, a peaceable development to gain a, a atomic energy as a, a source of power. But it is a, a nefarious and plot that is satanic to destroy the nation of Israel. We were called by God to live in just such a time as this. My family and I were having one of those... In, in, fun discussions, if you could live at any time in the history of the world and not in, during Jesus' time, you know, what, what other time would you want to live in? And we were talking that through and, and all in and, and a whimsical conversation. But here is the reality. God could have placed you at any point in history for you to live and to let your light shine. God chose today, right now, the days of Noah, for you to be able to let your light shine. You are not here by accident. You have a purpose and you have a plan that God has for your life. And so just as God protected the, the godly, <laughs> Noah and his family, against the immorality of the world, so also will God protect you, the godly, from the immorality of the world around and we are called to let our light shine, to live boldly, authentically, to love God, and to love others, uh, and to look up for our redemption is drawing near. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We ask that you would just bless us and fill us and strengthen us and refresh us. Lord, may we be encouraged by the knowledge that, that you know how to protect the godly. And so, God, protect us, bless us, help us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.